The Christmas Eve Burglary by Arnold Bennett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lady Dane said, Gee, if that portrait stays there much longer, you'll just have to take me off to Pyre Hill one of these fine mornings. Pyre Hill is the seat of the great local hospital, but it is also the seat of the great local lunatic asylum, and when the inhabitants of the five towns say merely Pyre Hill, they mean the asylum. I do declare I can't fancy my food nowadays, said Lady Dane, and it's all that portrait. She stared plaintively up at the immense oil painting which faced her as she sat at the breakfast table in her spacious and opulent dining room. Sir Jehoshaphat made no remark. Despite Lady Dane's animadversions upon it, despite the undoubted fact that it was generally disliked in the five towns, the portrait had cost a thousand pounds, some said guineas, and though not yet two years old, it was probably worth at least fifteen hundred in the picture market, for it was a cressage, and not only was it a cressage, it was one of the finest cressages in existence. It marked the summit of Sir Jehoshaphat's career. Sir Jehoshaphat's career was, perhaps, the most successful and brilliant in the entire social history of the five towns. This famous man was the principal partner in Dane Brothers. His brother was dead, but two of Sir G's sons were in the firm. Dane Brothers were the largest manufacturers of cheap earthenware in the district, catering chiefly for the American and colonial buyer. They had an extremely bad reputation for cutting prices. They were hated by every other firm in the five towns, and to hear rival manufacturers talk, one would gather the impression that Sir G. had acquired a tremendous fortune by systematically selling goods under cost. They were also hated by between eighteen and nineteen hundred employees. But such hatred, however virulent, had not marred the progress of Sir G.'s career. He had meant to make a name, and he had made it. The five towns might laugh at his vulgar snobbishness. The five towns might sneer at his calculated philanthropy. But he was, nevertheless, the best-known man in the five towns, and it was precisely his snobbishness and his philanthropy which had carried him to the top. Moreover, he had been the first public man in the five towns to gain a knighthood, the five towns could not deny that it was very proud indeed of this knighthood. The means by which he had won this distinction were neither here nor there. He had won it. And was he not the father of his native borough? Had he not been three times mayor of his native borough? Was not the whole northern half of the county dotted and spangled by his benefactions, his institutions, his endowments? and it could not be denied that he sometimes tickled the five towns as the five towns likes being tickled. There was, for example, the notorious Sneed incident. Sneed Hall, belonging to the Earl of Chell, lies a few miles south of the five towns, and from it the pretty Countess of Chell exercises that condescending meddlesomeness which so frequently exasperates the five towns. Sir G. had got his title by the aid of the Countess, interfering Iris, as she is locally dubbed. Shortly afterwards he had contrived to quarrel with the Countess, and the quarrel was conducted by Sir G. as a quarrel between equals, which delighted the district. Sir G.'s final word in it had been to buy a sizable tract of land near Sneed Village, just off the Sneed Estate, and to erect thereon a mansion quite as imposing as Sneed Hall, and far more up-to-date, and to call the mansion Sneed Castle. A mighty stroke! Iris was furious, the Earl speechless with fury, but they could do nothing, 
naturally the five towns was tickled it was apropos of the housewarming of sneed castle also of the completion of his third mayoralty and of the inauguration of the dane technical institute that the movement had been started primarily by a few toadies for tendering to sir g a popular gift worthy to express the profound esteem in which he was officially held in the five towns it having been generally felt that the gift should take the form of a portrait a local dilettante had suggested cressage and when the five towns had inquired into cressage and discovered that that genius from the united states was celebrated throughout the civilized world and regarded as the equal of velasquez whoever velasquez might be and that he had painted half the aristocracy and that his income was regal the suggestion was accepted and cressage was approached cressage haughtily consented to paint sir g's portrait on his usual conditions namely that the sitter should go to the little village in bedfordshire where cressage had his principal studio and that the painting should be exhibited at the royal academy before being shown anywhere else cressage was an r a but no one thought of putting r a after his name he was so big that instead of the royal academy conferring distinction on him he conferred distinction on the royal academy sir g went to bedfordshire and was rapidly painted and he came back gloomy the presentation committee went to bedfordshire later to inspect the portrait and they too came back gloomy then the academy exhibition opened and the portrait showing sir g in his robe and chain and in a chair was instantly hailed as possibly the most glorious masterpiece of modern times all the critics were of one accord the committee and sir g were reassured but only partially and sir g rather less so than the committee for there was something in the enthusiastic criticisms which gravely disturbed them an enlightened generation thoroughly familiar with the dazzling yearly succession of cressage's portraits need not be told what this something was one critic wrote that cressage displayed even more than his quote, customary astounding insight into character end quote another critic wrote that cressage's observation was as usual quote, calmly and coldly hostile end quote. another referred to the quote, typical provincial mayor immortalized for the diversion of future ages end quote. inhabitants of the five towns went to london to see the work for which they had subscribed and they saw a mean little old man with thin lips and a straggling grey beard and shifty eyes and pushful snob written all over him ridiculous in his gewgaws of office when you looked at the picture close to it was a meaningless mass of coloured smudges but when you stood fifteen feet away from it the portrait was absolutely lifelike amazing miraculous it was so wondrously lifelike that some of the inhabitants of the five towns burst out laughing many people felt sorry not for sir g but for lady dane lady dane was beloved and genuinely respected she was a simple homely sincere woman her one weakness being that she had never been able to see through sir g of course at the presentation ceremony the portrait had been ecstatically referred to as a possession precious for ever and the recipient and his wife pretended to be overflowing with pure joy in the ownership of it it had been hanging in the dining-room of sneed castle about sixteen months when lady dane told her husband that it would ultimately drive her into the lunatic asylum don't be silly wife said sir g i wouldn't part with that portrait for ten times what it cost this was to speak bluntly a downright lie sir g secretly hated the portrait more than any one hated it 
he would have been almost ready to burn down Sneed Castle in order to get rid of the thing. But it happened that on the previous evening, in conversation with the magistrate's clerk, his receptive brain had been visited by a less expensive scheme than burning down the castle. Lady Dane sighed. "'Are you going to town early?' she inquired. "'Yes,' he replied. "'I'm on the rota today.' He was chairman of the borough bench of magistrates. As he drove into town, he revolved his scheme, and thought it wild and dangerous, but still feasible. 2. On the bench that morning, Sir G. shocked Mr. Sherratt, the magistrate's clerk, and he utterly disgusted Mr. Bourne, superintendent of the borough police. I do not intend to name the name of the borough, whether Bursley, Hanbridge, Knipe, Longshore, or Turnhill. The inhabitants of the five towns will know without being told. The rest of the world has no right to know. There had recently occurred a somewhat thrilling series of burglaries in the district, and the burglars, a gang of them was presumed, had escaped the solicitous attentions of the police. But on the previous afternoon, an underling of Mr. Bourne's had caught a man who was generally believed to be wholly or partly responsible for the burglaries. The five towns breathed with relief and congratulated Mr. Bourne, and Mr. Bourne was well pleased with himself. The Staffordshire Signal headed the item of news, Smart Capture of a Supposed Burglar. The supposed burglar gave his name as William Smith, and otherwise behaved in an extremely suspicious manner. Now Sir G., sitting as Chief Magistrate in the police court, actually dismissed the charge against the man. Overruling his sole colleague on the bench that morning, Alderman Easton, he dismissed the charge against William Smith, holding that the evidence for the prosecution was insufficient to justify even a remand. No wonder that Mr. Bourne was discouraged, not to say angry. No wonder that that pillar of the law, Mr. Sherratt, was pained and shocked. At the conclusion of the case, Sir Jehoshaphat said that he would be glad to speak with William Smith afterwards in the magistrate's room, indicating that he sympathised with William Smith and wished to exercise upon William Smith his renowned philanthropy. And so, at about noon, when the court majestically rose, Sir G. retired to the magistrate's room, where the humble Alderman Easton was discreet enough not to follow him, and awaited William Smith. And William Smith came, guided thither by a policeman, to whom, in parting from him, he made a rude, surreptitious gesture. Sir G., seated in the armchair which dominates the other chairs round the elm table in the magistrate's room, emitted a preliminary cough. <clears throat> Smith, he said sternly, leaning his elbows on the table, you were very fortunate this morning, you know. And he gazed at Smith. Smith stood near the door, cap in hand. He did not resemble a burglar, who surely ought to be big, muscular, and masterful. He resembled an undersized clerk who has been out of work for a long time, but who has nevertheless found the means to eat and drink rather plenteously, he was clothed in a very shabby navy blue suit, frayed at the wrists and ankles, and greasy in front. His linen collar was brown with dirt, his fingers were dirty, his hair was unkempt and long, and a young and lusty black beard was sprouting on his chin. His boots were not at all pleasant. "'Yes, Governor,' Smith replied lightly, with a Manchester accent. "'And what's your game?' Sir G. was taken aback. He, the chairman of the borough bench and the leading philanthropist in the county, to be so spoken to. But what could he do? He himself had legally established Smith's innocence. Smith was as free as air, and had a perfect right to adopt any tone he chose to any man he chose. And Sir G. desired a service from William Smith. 
"'I was hoping I might be of use to you,' said Sir Jehoshaphat diplomatically. "'Well,' said Smith, "'that's all right, that is. "'But none of your philanthropic dodges, you know. "'I don't want to lead a new life, "'and I don't want to turn over a new leaf, "'and I don't want a helping hand nor none of those things. "'And what's more, I don't want a situation. "'I've got all the situation as I need. "'But I never refuse money, nor beer neither. "'Never did, and I'm forty years old next month.' "'I suppose burgling doesn't pay very well, does it?' Sir G. boldly ventured. William Smith laughed coarsely. "'It pays right enough,' said he. "'But I don't put my money on my back, Governor. "'I put it into a bit of public-house property when I get the chance.' "'It may pay,' said Sir G. "'But it is wrong. It is very antisocial.' "'Is it, indeed?' Smith returned dryly. "'Antisocial, is it? Well, I've heard it called plenty of things in my time, but never that. Now, I should have called it quite sociable-like, sort of making free with strangers and so on. However,' he added, "'I come across a cove once as told me crime was nothing but a disease and ought to be treated as such. I asked him for a dozen of port, but he never sent it.' "'Ever been caught before?' Sir G. inquired. "'Not much,' Smith exclaimed. "'And this'll be a lesson to me, I can tell you. "'Now, what are you getting at, Governor? "'Because my time's money, my time is.' Sir G. coughed once more. "'Sit down,' said Sir G. "'And William Smith sat down opposite to him at the table.' and put his shiny elbows on the table precisely in the manner of Sir G's elbows. Well, he cheerfully encouraged Sir G. How should you like to commit a burglary that was not a crime? said Sir G, his shifty eyes wandering around the room. A perfectly lawful burglary. What are you getting at? William Smith was genuinely astonished. "'At my residence, Sneed Castle,' Sir G. proceeded, "'there's a large portrait of myself in the dining-room "'that I want to have stolen, you understand?' "'Stolen?' "'Yes, I want to get rid of it, "'and I want uh, people to think that it has been stolen. "'Well, why don't you stop up one night and steal it yourself "'and then burn it?' William Smith suggested. "'That would be deceitful,' said Sir G. gravely. "'I could not tell my friends that the portrait had been stolen if it had not been stolen. "'The burglary must be entirely genuine.' "'What's the figure?' said Smith curtly. "'Figure? What are you going to give me for the job?' "'Give you for doing the job?' Sir G. repeated, his secret and ineradicable meanness aroused. "'Give you? Why, I'm giving you the opportunity to honestly steal a picture that's worth over a thousand pounds. I dare say it would be worth two thousand pounds in America. And you want to be paid into the bargain? Do you know, my man, that people come all the way from Manchester and even London to see that portrait? He told Smith about the painting. Then why are you in such a stew to be rid of it? queried the burglar. That's my affair, said Sir G. I don't like it. Lady Dane doesn't like it. But it's a presentation portrait, and so I can't... <laughs> "'You see, Mr. Smith?' "'And how am I going to dispose of it when I've got it?' Smith demanded. "'You can't melt a portrait down as if it was silver. "'By what you say, Governor, it's known all over the blessed world. "'Seems to me I might just as well try to sell the Nelson column.' "'Oh, nonsense,' said Sir G. "'Nonsense! You'll sell it in America quite easily. "'It'll be a fortune to you.' "'Keep it for a year first, and then send it to New York.' "'William Smith shook his head and drummed his fingers on the table, "'and then, quite suddenly, he brightened and said, 
"'All right, Governor. I'll take it on, just to oblige you.' "'When can you do it?' asked Sir G., hardly concealing his joy. "'Tonight?' "'No,' said Smith mysteriously. "'I'm engaged tonight.' "'Well, tomorrow night?' "'No, tomorrow. I'm engaged tomorrow, too.' "'You seem to be very much engaged, my man,' Sir G. observed. "'What do you expect?' Smith retorted. "'Business is business. I could do it the night after tomorrow.' "'But that's Christmas Eve,' Sir G. protested. "'What if it is Christmas Eve?' said Smith coldly. "'Would you prefer Christmas Day? I'm engaged on Boxing Day and the day after.' "'Not in the five towns, I trust,' Sir G. remarked. "'No,' said Smith shortly. "'The five towns is about so dry.' The affair was arranged for Christmas Eve. Uh, now, Sir G. suggested, uh, shall I draw your plan of the castle so that you can— William Smith's face expressed terrific scorn. Do you suppose, he said, as I haven't had plans of your castle ever since it was built? What do you take me for? I'm not a blooming excursionist, I'm not. I'm a businessman, that's what I am. Sir G. was snubbed and he agreed submissively to all William Smith's arrangements for the innocent burglary. He perceived that in William Smith he had stumbled on a professional of the highest class, and this good fortune pleased him. "'There's only one thing that riles me,' said Smith in parting, "'and that is that you'll go and say that after you'd done everything you could for me, I went and burgled your castle.' and you'll talk about the ingratitude of the lower classes. I know you, Governor. 3. On the afternoon of the 24th of December, Sir Jehoshaphat drove home to Sneed Castle from the principal of the three Dane manufactories, and found Lady Dane superintending the work of packing up trunks. He and she were to quit the castle that afternoon in order to spend Christmas on the other side of the five towns under the roof of their eldest son John, who had a new house, a new wife, and a new baby, male. John was a domineering person, and being rather proud of his house and all that was his, he had obstinately decided to have his own Christmas at his own hearth. Grandpapa and Grandmamma, drawn by the irresistible attraction of that novelty, a grandson, though Mrs. John had declined to have the little thing named Jehoshaphat, had yielded to John's solicitations, and the family gathering for the first time in history was not to occur round Sir G's mahogany. Sir G very characteristically said nothing to Lady Dane immediately, he allowed her to proceed with the packing of the trunks, and then tea was served, and the time was approaching for the carriage to come round to take them to the station, when at last he suddenly remarked, "'I shan't be able to go with you to John's this afternoon.' "'Oh, gee!' she exclaimed. "'Really, you are tiresome. Why couldn't you tell me before?' "'I will come over tomorrow morning, perhaps in time for church.' he proceeded, ignoring her demand for an explanation. He always did ignore her demand for an explanation. Indeed, she only asked for explanations in a mechanical and perfunctory manner. She had long since ceased to expect them. Sir G. had been born like that, devious, mysterious, incalculable, and Lady Dane accepted him as he was. She was somewhat surprised, therefore, when he went on, "'I have some minutes of committee meetings that I really must go carefully through and send off to-night, and you know as well as I do there'll be no chance of doing that at John's. I've telegraphed to John.' He was obviously nervous and self-conscious. "'There's no food in the house,' sighed Lady Dane, "'and the servants are all going away except Callear, and he can't cook your dinner to-night.' "'I think I'd better stay myself and look after you.' "'You'll do no such thing,' said Sir G. decisively. "'As for my dinner, uh, anything will do for that. 
the servants have been promised their holiday to start from this evening, and they must have it. I can manage. Here spoke the philanthropist with his unshakable sense of justice. So Lady Dane departed, anxious and worried, having previously arranged something cold for Sir G in the dining-room, and instructed Callear about boiling the water for Sir G's tea on Christmas morning. Callear was the under-coachman and a useful odd man. He it was who would drive Sir G to the station on Christmas morning, and then guard the castle and the stables thereof during the absence of the family and the other servants. Callear slept over the stables. And after Sir G had consumed his cold repast in the dining-room, the other servants went, and Sir G was alone in the castle facing the portrait. He had managed the affair fairly well, he thought. Indeed, he had a talent for chicane, and none knew it better than himself. It would have been dangerous if the servants had been left in the castle, they might have suffered from insomnia and heard William Smith and interfered with the operations of William Smith. On the other hand, Sir G. had no intention whatever of leaving the castle uninhabited to the mercies of William Smith. He felt that he himself must be on the spot to see that everything went right and that nothing went wrong. Thus the previously arranged scheme for the servant's holiday fitted perfectly into his plans, and all that he had had to do was to refuse to leave the castle till the morrow. It was ideal. Nevertheless, he was a little afraid of what he had done, and of what he was going to permit William Smith to do. It was certainly dangerous, certainly rather a wild scheme. However, the die was cast— and within twelve hours he would be relieved of the intolerable incubus of the portrait. And when he thought of the humiliations which that portrait had caused him, when he remembered the remarks of his sons concerning it, especially John's remarks, when he recalled phrases about it in London newspapers, he squirmed and told himself that no scheme for getting rid of it could be too wild and perilous. And, after all, the burglary dodge was the only dodge, absolutely the only conceivable practical method of disposing of the portrait, except burning down the castle. And surely it was preferable to a conflagration, to arson. Moreover, in case of fire at the castle, some blundering fool would be sure to cry, The portrait! The portrait must be saved! And the portrait would be saved. He gazed at the repulsive, hateful thing. In the centre of the lower part of the massive gold frame was the legend, Presented to Sir Jehoshaphat Dane, Knight, as a mark of public esteem and gratitude, etc. He wondered if William Smith would steal the frame. It was to be hoped that he would not steal the frame. In fact, William Smith would find it very difficult to steal that frame, unless he had an accomplice or so. "'This is the last time I shall see you,' said Sir G. to the portrait. Then he unfastened the catch of one of the windows in the dining-room, as per contract with William Smith, turned out the electric light, and went to bed in the deserted castle. He went to bed but not to sleep. It was no part of Sir G.'s programme to sleep. He intended to listen, and he did listen. And about two o'clock, precisely the hour which William Smith had indicated, he fancied he heard muffled and discreet noises. Then he was sure that he heard them. William Smith had kept his word. Then the noises ceased for a period, and then they recommenced. Sir G. restrained his curiosity as long as he could, and when he could restrain it no more, he rose and silently opened his bedroom window, and put his head out into the nipping night air of Christmas. And by good fortune he saw the vast oblong of the picture, carefully enveloped in sheets, 
being passed by a couple of dark figures through the dining-room window to the garden outside. William Smith had a colleague then, and he was taking the frame as well as the canvas. Sir G. watched the men disappear down the avenue, and they did not reappear. Sir G. returned to bed. Yes, he felt himself equal to facing it out with his family and friends. He felt himself equal to pretending that he had no knowledge of the burglary. Having slept a few hours, he got up early and, half-dressed, descended to the dining-room just to see what sort of a mess William Smith had made. The canvas of the portrait lay flat on the hearth-rug, with the following words written on it in chalk, This is no use to me. It was the massive gold frame that had gone. Further, as was later discovered, all the silver had gone. Not a spoon was left in the castle. End of the Christmas Eve Burglary by Arnold Bennett Recording by Ruth Golding Christmas 2013